that's been here since last July. Okay, and I think already we've really inspired a lot of uh, movement and development among that relations office. It's uh, very encouraging. So with, the, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Shoni to talk about sustainability. Great. Thank you, Doug. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Seventy some degrees outside. Perhaps I'm be out under a tree. I but appreciate the opportunity to, to spend uh, spend the afternoon, uh, part of the afternoon with, with you as Doug Chair. My name is Shane Jacobs, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations here at uh, what will soon be your alma mater, your alma college. And um, I've structured this presentation in a way that allows us to take a, a, a couple of different uh, viewpoints through a few different lenses on sustainability in, in Grinnell College. Uh, most relevant to the work that I do is the financial sustainability of the institution, and so that's primarily the framework that I'm going to deliver to you today. Uh, but certainly your, your, your preparatory reading and anything else you may want to talk about uh, about the college, I'm happy to, uh, to take a deep dive. We'll also do a, a, a the framework of uh, some Q&A at, at the end, but that shouldn't mean you hesitate to jump in at any point in time. Uh, I think it's uh, appropriate that I'm here today on what is Scarlet and Give Back Day, and a number of you have likely already seen the, the tents or received the emails. Certainly you can see the sticker, but we today are, for the first time in Grinnell College's history, initiating a one-day giving challenge, and the idea is that participation at all levels, at any level, matters. It matters because it invests in you, the students. And one of the reasons, it's primarily the reason I'm in this line of work, I'm a first generation college student. Um, I uh, had to finance my entire education, and I believe in the power of the seats you're sitting in and what it means uh, to you, what it means to society uh, in general. And uh, it's very empowering, very exciting, and, uh, coming to work every single day working to engage alumni and friends in the community in a more closely knit relationship with the institution so that it can improve and support and enhance your experience uh, as a student. So thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you today. Actually, I will, I will add, does anybody know what the Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations does? What do you think that means? Brave souls. Yeah. Call them now. I, I, I sit at my desk and I call them. Out. Okay. Some days. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you probably sit in a lot of meetings uh, with the college board deciding, you know, like, are, are we going to build more stuff? What are, what's the college plan for the next couple of years? Kind of stuff. So thinking about institutional strategy, budgets, priorities. And call them alumni at the same time. The way I frame it is I'm your chief cheerleader. Right? Maybe overly simplistic, I would argue significantly oversimplistic, but nonetheless, uh, in, in addition to the president, chief fundraiser, chief cheerleader for the institution. And uh, I spend most of my time talking to alumni and friends and preparing with many other leaders on campus how we can frame a model that engages alumni and friends to invest in the institution invest their time, their talent, certainly their philanthropic uh, capacities, as well as their broader networks with uh, this institution. But today, I thought I'd break down the, the uh, conversation into a couple of key areas. First is unfolding, just at a high level, who we are in development and alumni relations, so you have the context of my work and our work that connects very significantly to one of the three revenue lines that addresses the financial sustainability of the college. Uh, capture that then within the DAR. I'll use DAR. It stands for Development and Alumni Relations. Get used to it when you're alum. You will hear DAR, 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 DAR over and over and over again. Um, uh, the programming model. We'll discuss the revenue model and then our future as an institution. Let me start with uh, a quote directly from your reading for today. One of the biggest challenges for educational institutions is to find ways to diversify their revenue streams. What does that mean? Does that mean, do you think, to Grinnell College? <coughs> you want to have money coming in from a lot of different places? 
So not just one source of income, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. Another way to think about diversification of revenue. Why is that beneficial? Because the university is a business in some regards. So we, we don't operate in a vacuum. We have to meet certain expenses and liabilities. When I think of the, the yeah. Please, some of your revenue streams are shaky. Please. How so? Well, that uh, you have to diversify. Mm -hmm. If you had a, if you had a stable revenue stream, you wouldn't need to diversify. Yes, 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 yes. I think of it as a, as a risk, right? So, so mitigating risk in any organization, any nonprofit, any for-profit organization, attempts to mitigate risk through a diversification of income and revenue streams. For the institution, we can lower our risk to be in financial uh, challenging times if we diversify and strengthen the revenue stream. So for the college, this is my lens on the ground college, one of our biggest challenges is to establish a sustainable capital. <coughs> it's our mission, and it's if for any of you that go into nonprofit, how many of you could imagine yourself in nonprofit work? In many respects, nonprofits hold tightly to their mission, what their societal impact is and could be. And in many respects, it's our mission, it's their mission, as long as we can afford it. So a bit about development and alumni relations. These will be the only slides that I'll really go deep into the weeds of reading out loud, but I don't know if it quite makes it all the way to the back. Our office, our core values, we established this in the last three months, uh, contextually I should have added, uh, that I came to the college uh, in July last summer. I've been here about nine months. I'm a native Iowan, so it's, I'm actually returning home. Uh, I grew up in small town Iowa, so I don't know how many of you have experienced small town Iowa before coming to the college. But this feels like home uh, to me. None nonetheless, so core values. What are our non-negotiables? I would encourage you that is you prepare for your career to evaluate your first jobs, pay attention to core values of the organizations that you're looking to join. But our core values in development and alumni relations are we advance the mission and values of Grinnell College by providing alumni and donor-centric engagement opportunities for the greater Grinnell College community. This is achieved with integrity, respect, commitment, proficiency, and transparency. We support one another with an inclusive, collaborative, and healthy environment characterized by honest communication and championship level preparation and performance. So in our mind, these are the non-negotiables. For as long as we are who we are being asked to do what we're being asked to do, this is how we're going to do our work, non-negotiable. Our mission, we believe this shelf life to be at least for the next 100 years, probably beyond. To buy meaningful and lifelong relationships that transform lives through Grinnell education. It's what we are being asked to do. It's what we attempt to bring to life each and every day. And a vision. We were significantly lacking a vision in our office. And we've developed one. And in essence, we believe this vision to be a finish line for us in the next 10 to 20 years. We also believe this vision has maybe a 60 to 80 percent likelihood of success largely because we've underperformed in one of our revenue streams, which is a critical component of sustainability here at Grinnell, and that is in the fundraising arena. But our vision is to enhance targeted engagement opportunities that strengthen the Grinnell network, which provide a platform for delivering $150 million plus campaigns that uplift our most treasured assets. And that last part, our most treasured assets, is you. It's you, it's Doug, it's his colleagues, it's the facilities, it's the programs, it's the teams, right? Our goal is to uplift this institution. We believe that philanthropy is absolutely essential from a revenue line standpoint to make the future a reality. I'm going to briefly touch on this slide just to give you a bit of a structural framework for our organization. And it's too small to read, but know that we are structured into three main categories. The work we do raise money, the work we do to engage individuals in most everything but raising money, and then a team dedicated to the back-end enterprise, the infrastructure that allows our systems to work. The three lines on the left, the three box lines on the left, 
our staff who do nothing but spend time calling alumni, emailing alumni, and traveling around the country meeting with alumni and friends and some parents to make annual gifts, one-time gifts in the institution, major plan principal gifts, which are bigger gifts to the institution, sometimes deferred in the state gifts, a gift that they might want to leave to the institution upon uh, death or the death of their children, which sounds really morbid right, to be talking about. But the reality is we raise significant resources here. It's part of our sustainability, and that's important. The middle uh, box here, we have a pointer, I don't know if it works. Uh, the middle box is related to donor stewardship. So as you enter, if you enter nonprofit work and your organization raises money, which it's almost a guarantee that that, that would be the case, the ability to steward donors, the ability to say thank you once a gift has arrived and to do it in meaningful ways is absolutely essential and it's likely the best form of cultivation of a new gift. So we have a donor stewardship team. We have an alumni relations team, which is the, the, the box line second from the right. It's our uh, alumni relations team. That team focuses on broad engagement uh, in, in our key markets. We have 12 primary markets around the country where we focus most of our alumni relations events activities. Why? That's where most alumni live, right? So we have to have focused efforts in many of those key markets. That team also prioritizes and focuses their efforts with the admissions office. So cultivating interest by alumni to interview. How many of you went through the interview on the admissions? Anybody interview with an alum? So we have a, it's our number one volunteer program. 1,200 alumni every year help us with that interview process. Internships, externships, anyone done an internship or externship? Okay. This team partners with alumni and, and parents and friends who have interest in helping build internships and externships career service experience. And then on the right, we have a team uh, who focuses on data, data analytics, research, uh, creating uh, analytical models that, that help drive in what is a, a, a finite set of resources, the ability to deploy those resources in smart ways and with individuals who are most likely to make a philanthropic gift to the college. And the rest are basic gift processing operations uh, positions. I know this class soon, you uh, will be given a survey and alumni to call. That's something you've, you've talked about, right? Um, and part of your calling is to unfold a conversation with alumni uh, about their experience. I want to share with you how vitally important it is that you make these calls. The data that you gain about our alumni during the survey is going to help drive three of these functional business units in work we do going forward. It's going to inform us how our alumni feel about certain engagement and how our alumni would like to be engaged going forward. We've pointed at young alumni engagement as one of our most vital areas of focus going forward, largely because the better job we do engaging alumni, especially young alumni, hopefully all of you soon, the more likely it is that you will want to stay connected and networked and engaged with your alma mater, your class, your friends, and hopefully at some point consider making a gift back to Grinnell College. But I can't underscore enough how important it is the work that you have coming forward. And we can certainly dive into that later if you'd like. Any questions on how we're structured? The enterprise itself? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, like, there's a lot of focus on like, um, sort of getting their engagement, like, yeah. very after the fact. I mean, like, having them as that, like, revenue uh, stream. But I was wondering if, like, a lot of why the fundraising, I don't know if you said that that revenue stream is, like, pretty low or something. Yeah. I thought that had to do with, like, maybe, like, the satisfaction rates of the students while they are currently in school. So, like, do you guys have any, like, function that's not, like, the after of the, do you yeah. get what I'm saying? So like yeah. what sort of implementation of like how do we raise the satisfaction levels before they graduate? Kind of we thing? don't uh, currently have any corollary data that suggests bad experience as a student, so I will not give, and that's why I do not give. Okay. We, we don't have those data points. Um, when I, I worked for um, uh, for Phonathon, that was I, I guess like some people I guess would ha share yeah. that sentiment of like my satisfaction but then yeah. others would just say like well i'm not necessarily agreeing with like what the institution is doing now or like uh, yeah. you know just random like they're too liberal or i don't know yeah, yeah. 
Well, you heard, I'm, I'm sure, sitting in the phone phone room, calling yeah. uh, prospective donors a, a million different reasons why somebody would and wouldn't give. Uh, you know, for us, one of our limitations historically is that we've unfolded a, a giving model where we've asked alumni simply to give back, which is not bad or wrong. It's really important. It largely creates unrestricted gifts to the institution that the president and others can put into the scholarship program, into buildings, into, into faculty and research uh, maps, internships, etc. But many times, if there is a negative experience with the institution, there's still something about campus that matters. There's still something about campus that's important and impactful and meaningful and likely still has a connection to the alum. What we've done a poor job of doing is building a, a framework around fundraising whereby the alum can point at the something on campus. If it's not broadly defined, the something specific on campus that still means something to them, whether it be a faculty member, an academic department, a, a, an athletics team, uh, the fact that they received a scholarship and they wouldn't be here if it were not for the scholarship, at least invest in the student who was like me when I enrolled. And the stories could go on and on. So part of our framework and how we're going to unfold this going forward, and I encourage you to be part of our exercise here at the end, is to think about what matters. When you graduate, you're going to have Grinnell College and many, many other nonprofits for your whole entire life asking you to give. So being smart about what it is you care about, why you care about it, and how it is that you want to create impact, and how will you measure that impact, and how will we tell you that you've created impact, those are all thoughts that hopefully will be in your mind. Yes? Yeah, so you mentioned earlier that you are trying to engage young alumni even more now, sure. um, earlier on, so they'll stay connected and they need to make gifts. But do you, like, I don't know if the data suggests that young alumni are less likely to give because I know, I mean, I'm graduating this mm -hmm. year and we're getting letters like, oh, you know, <laughs> give back and everything. Yep. It's just like, I, among our care, it's just like, we have all these loans to pay off yep. and we're not looking at necessarily donating. Yep. Um, yep. So I'm wondering, like, what does the data suggest and, like, what, what are, are like, the, the strategies? Yeah. There's, a, there's another slide coming up that talks about uh, alumni giving rates. But um, So I, like you, have had college debt, or like you will have college debt. Um, in many respects, the, the psychological behavior of young alumni and, and the behavior of actually making a philanthropic gift mirrors closely, not identical, but closely the same uh, uh, psychological behavior that occurs at a point of purchase sale in the grocery store. You want to buy Snickers, right? Whether you have money in your pocket or not, you might, you might want that Snickers, it costs a dollar. Right? In many respects, the, the scale of giving in the young alumni space compared to the scale of giving later in life is less by the volume of donors and by dollar figure. Our goal is in that moment when we ask you to give, if it's 10, if it's 15, or 25, or 50, those numbers matter. But what's most significant is that you participate. And so part of what, we, what we're trying to do is we should pivot the conversation away from giving at all costs, when the reality is we don't want you to give at all costs. We want you to give in meaningful ways and to areas of campus that you care about. Um, certainly, we respect the fact everyone's going to have, uh, most everyone will have loans, uh, uh, other priorities, other obligations, other, other responsibilities. But in the moment, at least once per year, when you get the chance to say, thank you, Grinnell, or I care about X, or I want to give back to another student because of Y, at whatever level, we want to be encouraged that behavior. Um, we need to leverage a stronger career services program so that when you're interacting with the Grinnell Career Services Network, you find value in that. That might be something that you would want to support as a young alum or later in life. We have a, uh, Michelle Zarnecki, some of you may know Michelle. Michelle is our student relationship program coordinator. So we have a staff member who does nothing else but partner with SGA, Student Alumni Council, and attempts to unfold programs here on campus. It's just starting. So if you haven't experienced the program or Michelle yet, uh, we're excited about where it's going. Uh, but the idea being that when you graduate, the first time you hear from us shouldn't be make a gift, right? <laughs> Give back, write a check. No, well, is that important? Sure, but there are other ways that you should be engaged. And that's that's from the point of the point. So that engagement platform, the transition, uh, we break it down into four spaces. Time, talent, treasure, and ties. 
There's so many ways that you can give back, even if in the moment you can't afford to make a gift of $5 to Grinnell College. That's okay. It's okay. We'd love to give that when you can. But bottom line, there are other ways that you can impact and influence the institution when you're an alum. And in fact, while you're a student, nonetheless, the time space. Some of you may become class agents, class fundraisers. Some of you may volunteer for the institution. You will engage in markets where you go, where you graduate, where you live and work, where you can partner with other Grinnellians. We're launching the first ever Grinnell Day of Service later here in June, where we're going to encourage all Grinnellians in the communities that they live, work, and serve to give back. And we know Grinnellians worldwide do this every single day. We're going to shine a spotlight. So giving of time, giving of talent, coming back and speaking in a class. Maybe the future Doug will be inviting you back. Maybe Doug will invite you back here as you are a young alum. Come back to this class to speak, to be engaged. Uh, I think it's really important to think about the ways that whatever your talent is, whatever you go on and do, what are the ways that that can connect? Of course, treasure is the giving and then ties, networking. That we ask you to consider opportunities to engage with your classmates at reunion in the markets that you live, uh, work, and serve, being part of internship programs. Wherever you go to work, you should ask yourself. You could do this on maybe not day number one, but let's say month number three. Take your head up. Are we the type of organization that has internships? Is there a way for me to at least find the person internally that I should talk to about bringing a Grinnellian in here to do an internship? So there are many different ways that you can be engaged with us post-graduation. So the legs of the development school, stool, we've talked about annual gifts, major and principal and deferred gifts. But this is what we call a gift pyramid. This is a gift pyramid for Grinnell College. Nearly every single gift that we receive at the institution by number is an annual gift, a gift of less than $25,000. In fact, most gifts to the institution are less than $250,000, excuse me, $200,000. We have very specific efforts focused on uh, uh, gifts of $25,000 or more. We have about 3,000 individuals who could give us a gift of $25,000 or more, most of whom are alumni. And then our principal gifts, these would be the, the highest level gifts. If you go to a nonprofit and you do work, if you go for, to a for-profit and you do capital raising, either way, if there isn't a gift pyramid, if there isn't an investment pyramid, you should start one. You should build one. You should ask questions. Who are the people who are most likely to invest in us? How should we prioritize our time? And the way we prioritize our time largely is starting at the top of the gift pyramid working our way down in terms of the FTE capital that goes into these efforts. Does that make sense? Get pyramid. Anybody, anybody a data geek like me? No. <laughs> no data geeks in here? Any brave souls want to put their hand halfway up? Numbers scary? They used to scare me. They still do something. So donors and dollars, annual giving. We think about the data, we are now taking steps that we've never taken before as an institution to understand behavior, to understand what these numbers actually mean and how we can improve. So as of the end of February, we just started running these data reports late last year. Uh, we run them at the end of every month. The number of donors to the institution, alumni donors are up, and the number of dollars to the institution are up. Marginally, in some respects, but they're up. Your uh, peers at other institutions are in institutions where it's flat or going down. Grinnell over a period of time has been flat or going down. As we think about sustainability, this is a very important slide to us. Losing donors affects annual cash flow revenue that helps underwrite scholarships and programs. Rarely does it actually keep the lights on at Grinnell because we have an endowment significant endowment that allows philanthropy not just to do the basic blocking and tackling, but actually create marginal excellence on campus. So we see green, and it's the first time that we've seen green in this space in some time, but it's a distinct focus because from the annual gifts space, at the bottom of the pyramid where most donors participate, those are the most likely donors to someday become major gift donors, to someday become principal gift donors. And you look at, in the nonprofit world, that's going to apply to any nonprofit that's raising money. You go into the for-profit for sector, in the capital raising business, same thing. You're going to have early investors that will consider investing even more based on certain attention, based on certain research that we do with them as investment partners. We 
We also have taken a deeper dive at the actual participation within the ways we solicit annual gifts. So some of you have uh, uh, certainly uh, received these, but mail, phone, <coughs> online, and other, this other category are alumni who show up at events and give us a $200 check or whatnot and come through any of our methods. What jumps off the page here? Online's up. Spot on. <laughs> you, you predictions for the future? Online will continue to continue. You know, possibly some kind of fun app that uh, you know might yeah. let, let you donate. Te text to give. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you laugh. I heard a few. You will in your lifetime, and probably not in the uh, not too distant future. Uh, you're probably going to receive a message from me or one of my colleagues asking me to text again. It's probably not too far. It's not the next year or two, but it's around the corner. Yeah, donors are becoming more comfortable making gifts online. Right? We're, we're a, a digital native society in many respects now. Phone, it's harder and harder to get people on the phone. And when we do, they don't necessarily give. It's harder to generate a gift. But we're building a different case for support for the institution. We'll talk about that momentarily, but I think importantly, it's not just being able to access the individual through email, through phone, in the mail. It's the case you build for why invest in me, why invest in us. So you think about the calls that you're making with alumni. Those alumni are receiving messages in these spaces, asking them to engage, asking them to give. And they either are or aren't. Okay, so what you learn about them and their behavior and the reaction they have to some of the ways we communicate and historically have built a case for support will affect what they say. So while we say we're, we're changing, we're building a more robust, more focused case for support in some respects, um, we have a lot of history to also work through. So I don't think you can ignore that. <coughs> a few more data slides. And now, now I feel like this is just for me, Doug, since I'm the data geek and no one else uh, is in this case. So cash flow. Okay, revenue, cash flow, generally same concept. When we generate philanthropy to the institution, it creates a receipt, which is cash. Someone sends a check, uh, for example, maybe somebody passes away and leaves us an estate gift. So far this year, at the end of February, February our year to date is $10.9 million. Last year, at the end of the year, we ended at $11.2 million last June 30. So we're going to surpass last year's receipt total, and actually we're just about there now, with three months left to go, which means more resources to invest in our students, in our faculty, in our programs, arguably to create a margin of excellence in what we do and how we do it at all, given the mission that we have, which is a very, very purposeful, real, and tangible mission. So as you Go into the workforce, while maybe it's not your day-to-day -day responsibility to think about cash flow, I'll guarantee you the organization you join, the institution, the entity, the business you join, someone somewhere is going to be thinking about cash flow. And you're going to be thinking about the diversification of that cash flow. And private investment into any enterprise is a very significant cash flow opportunity, certainly in higher education. We also evaluate our performance based on constituencies, alumni, parents, friends, corporations, foundations, and others. And we evaluate now what our communication strategies are to each and every one of these sectors. The other category, this is getting more technical than you want, you probably are wondering, well, what else is there if uh, these categories are, are it? Um, there, are, there are various um, financial structures that individuals can put money into, called donor advised funds, there's a few others. But individuals of certain means can move their money into a, a source that is not any one of these, and they can make a gift to Grinnell College or any other nonprofit that they may so choose. Anything jump off the page here? What, what strikes you as interesting, concerning, exciting? Giving by dollar figure. 
jump this year. Steady increase. This directly correlates to what will soon be your alma mater four years ago deciding it was important to talk about philanthropy, philanthropy publicly. It was important to ask alumni and friends to give. Yes? It's also a big jump in foundation. Foundation giving? Yep. Did anyone track closely the Mellon Foundation grant this institution received for the digital humanities, a partnership with the University of Iowa? Any of you have had Eric Simpson in class? Tremendous, tremendous investment by a foundation to position Grinnell College and the University of Iowa at the forefront of the development of digital humanities. Very, very exciting. Um, do you have data on you know, how cash flow, but also you know, expenses? Because I know yep. the alumni relations has grown a lot in the past year as well. So how does that compare? Yep. Yeah, I've got a slide that Call where it's going, but it will talk a bit about expenses and return on investment. It, to run this enterprise costs uh, about $2.97 million. So we generated 11, and we're not going to stop. It's a pretty good return on investment. We'll spend a little more time on expenses. It's a great question. The college has also have to, had to pivot away from cash, which is, that's going to sound odd, right? We're here talking about sustainability and revenue and cash flow. All of our peers, you're going to hear this when you graduate, all of our peers um, talk about raising significantly more money than Grinnell College. How many have heard that? Anyone? Other schools raise more money than we do. I at least see one head shake of your hand. That's okay. So you will hear this when you, amongst the alumni, other schools raise more money than we do. The reason is a couple fold, but the one I want to touch on in this slide is other schools are announcing we've raised 20 million, we've raised 30 million, we've raised 40 or 50 million. They're announcing their commitments total. So alumni make pledges for five years. Here's a thousand dollar gift, but I'll give it to you in $200 increments over each of the next five years. So here's a million dollar gift I'll pledge out over time. I'll document an estate gift to you. Or the cash, and I should say, the cash that comes in each and every year. So actually, we are much closer to our peers than it would seem. But we haven't told that story. And I think having a culture of philanthropy is an important driver to generating philanthropy. Um, I'm pleased to share today that we've generated $19.9 million in commitments this fiscal year to the institution. And actually, we just crossed the $20 million threshold this afternoon at about 1 o'clock. What follows with much of this is cash, right? Donors pay on their pledges, right? So we're actually much closer to our peers than it would seem publicly. Now to the expense equation. For every dollar that the college put into development and alumni relations last year, operations, Expenses, salaries, <coughs> benefits. We returned three dollars and seventy-nine cents back to the institution, a two hundred and seventy-eight point five percent return on investment. That's a pretty good bet. You gave me a dollar, and I said, "Thanks for the dollar." It's three dollars and seventy-nine cents. I'd probably take it. I take it. Anyone going to turn that down? Uh, what was the ROI? Fiscal year like 2012 or 2011. Less than that, significantly less than that, because we had generated less cash. Our cash flow models show us at this level or more from here to our five year model that we built out. So the ROI, ROI should go up, and we're not projecting expenses to build at the same rate as cash. So you think about endowment, we'll talk a bit about endowment as a revenue source. We have a tremendous endowment. We don't announce annually the rate of return on the endowment, but our endowment last year we think had one of the best years of any endowment in the country. 22, 23% return last year. Very rare, very lucky to have that kind of return. But in our work, 278%. So I think as you roll into your careers and you think about 
not just generating revenue if you're in those types of position, but what the expenses are and how you tell that story. The GitHub position, what the case for support, the case for investment, the case for capital is in any institution. The beauty of the work we do, though, is that the costs that go in to development work here at Grinnell do not come directly back to our office. We don't save a penny of them. We don't want to. It's meant to support all of you and what you do. I bet each of you touch some of these. Some of you might end up touching all of them. So I encourage you, again, as you transition and become an alumnus, think about what matters. Think about how you can engage. I would argue that the better we do enhancing many of these things, the better we do excelling the distinctiveness of the institution. How you can be proud of the institution, how you recruit new students to the institution. And the relative value of your degree, in many respects, rests in your ability to stay engaged and stay connected over a lifetime. So our revenue model, our current revenue, so now we're getting more into the nuts and bolts of sustainability numbers. Grinnell College's current revenue model is this pie here. To pay for the expenses of the college, 55% of Grinnell College is paid for by the earnings on the endowment, spending off of a $1.8 billion endowment. 39% is funded through net student revenue, tuition, fees. 6% is funded through gifts and other, so grants and whatnot, largely philanthropy. We built with the trustees, so this comes into the you sit in meetings and you talk to leadership, right? We've imagined a future that is a much healthier and much more sustainable revenue model for the institution. 45% of the expenses being paid for by the endowment, 45% through net student revenue, and 10% through gifts and other, with the idea that we have less reliance on an endowment, an endowment that fluctuates based on the market, it's not predictable, and if the market were ever to really significantly tank, and tank for a few years, we're in trouble. So we want less reliance on the endowment. Net student revenue, in essence, what that signals to our admissions office is in a need-blind effort and an approach in policy, how do we generate a few more students who have the capacity to pay. And the 10% is the land. So if we look at each one of those a bit more directly, we have a few enrollment goals, tensions in those enrollment goals. So as we build a revenue model that moves from 39 to 45%, these, these tensions exist. We have an academic profile and a level of selectivity that is second to none. Right? Well, close to it, I will say. Very, very selective. So you should be very proud. And I hope you understand uh, sitting in the seats you sit in, very few people get to do that. Really special thing. We have a discount rate, net tuition revenue. So we have to find ways to make Grinnell College affordable for those. And I wouldn't have been able to afford it, but I sure as heck know that. Through a discount rate, and then ensure that we have economic and racial and ethnic diversity within our class. So we have now 6,500 or so applications to the institution, and our admissions office is attempting to satisfy all of our objectives all at the same time. So if you think about how this connects into revenue and net tuition revenue, we can influence what we do on the recruitment side in each one of these buckets. And we can improve, in some ways, how we position and package and communicate the opportunity to accept a financial aid package and accept an offer for admissions. But ultimately, we can't influence the admissions decision on this. So admissions spends a lot of time thinking about what can we do on the front end in the recruitment to recruit the right students who will be successful and who will fit in many respects within these places of tension. And how can we ensure that the yield activity on the back end connects in a way that helps sustain the revenue model of the institution. The endowment, our pair 16, if you've not seen them before, 
probably have some friends at some of these institutions. We've identified a Pier 16 for comparison's sake. So revenue line one, net tuition revenue, net revenue line two, endowment. I think it's important on the expense side to understand how our expenses stack up when you look at a $1.8 billion endowment. One assumption could be, boy, you spent a lot of money on this, right? Actually, our expense profile, I'm always going to report data that they're going to be in the top half. We're largely in the bottom quartile. So our expenses are relatively low against our Pier 16. So at Grinnell College, it costs about $66,000 for each one of your seats. Nobody at Grinnell College is paying $66,000 to go to school here. And I think that's a very special thing that we're able to move forward, largely because we have an endowment of $1.8 billion. That endowment provides 55% of the revenue. These schools, most of them, had smaller endowments than Grinnell College did just a few years ago. You look at our endowment since 1980, and if you want to take a deep dive on how we arrived at a $1.8 billion endowment, I'm happy to do that maybe at the end. Um, but we've grown significantly in the last 20 years. Unfortunately, we only generate $69 million of gifts to the endowment, while the endowment itself has distributed $935 million since 1980 for student scholarships, programs, keep the lights on, a number of different things. We're lucky to have it. But, as you'll see here in 2008, quite a big drive, quite a big market swing. So if we rely on 55% of our expenses to come by way of one revenue source, high level risk. Mitigate risk, diversify investments, diversify income. The investment committee of the board of directors sets our investment policy. They have four primary foci. I'm going to read through it, but the idea is there's multiple lenses that they look through when evaluating the endowment. And their goal is perpetuity. Right? Their goal is not just today. Their goal is not just the four years that you're here. Their goal is, from a fiduciary standpoint, to ensure and protect the long-term viability of the endowment into perpetuity. And do so with long-term growth, predictable support, Spending that assumes inflation, right? So the endowment, if it just remained at $1.8 billion for the next 20 years, the relative value of the endowment 20 years from now, $1.8 billion is not as much 20 years from now as it is today in relative terms. And lastly, the third leg of that stool, we have net tuition revenue, we have endowment, we have philanthropy. I've shown you a number of slides. But arguably, the ability to generate cash flow and predictable cash flow at least at $11.2 million or above, and doing it in ways that evaluates expenses and is a high return on investment is important. I mentioned deferred gifts were really critical. The black bars represent a state gifts received to the institution. The red bars represent all other receipts, all other cash, who wrote one-time checks or made payments on pledges, what, what jumps out at you? State gifts are really volatile. State gifts are really volatile. Absolutely. I would argue, saying it in many of the same, same terms, different words, our ability to achieve success I solely depended on the unpredictable activity of realizing the state gift. We can't predict when anyone's going to die. In fact, if you document an estate gift to Grinnell, probably that's five years to that, right? Why not? So our, our goal is to shift this model so that the red is significant and the black is icing on the cake. I shouldn't say red, I should say scarlet. Scarlet is significant, black is icing on the cake. And then I'm going to end here with uh, uh, our futures. It relates to the fundraising. 
component of our revenue. We have to evaluate what we do based on data. We have to take a much smarter view and long-term view <coughs> at our enterprise and ensure that the data backs up decisions and it enhances and influences strategy. We have to reposition our case for support and we have to make targeted investments in development and loan regulations. So look forward, we have to look back. I don't know if anyone's good to great. Jim Collins fan is in good to great, Mr. Great. Couple head nods. Confront the brutal facts. I think that's point number two in his five point uh, argument. If you haven't read uh, Good to Great, put it on your reading list. Almost everyone in business at some point in time reads Good to Great by Jim Collins. Confront the brutal facts. It's hard to get to where you're going if you don't know who you are today. Question about young alumni giving earlier and that engagement strategy. Here's the data. Okay. Years after graduation on the horizontal axis, average number of donors per alumni class on the vertical axis. Each of the lines recommend, uh, 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 recognize decades of giving. So when you graduate, you will be part of this blue bar. Okay? What does that chart tell you? The lines equal number of donors per class per year post graduation. First year after graduation, 61st year after graduation. There's a general trend towards uh, decreasing donations after the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. Seems like we spiked up early and then start to fade a bit over time. Okay. Absolutely. More more recent graduates, like more recent decades, are also uh, more inclined to give less. So less donors per decade in the last 15 years than their counterparts graduating in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Yep. Of course, the drop off here is donors choosing not to give or donors passing away. Hard to give after you die. <laughs> Morbid, I know. <laughs> um, I look at this and we look at this thing, the very same thing you just said. I also look at this and say, if we're not successful here, first five years, first five, ten years, predictably, we're going to be significantly lower than your colleagues that are in classes that graduated many years ago. So if we do not build a much more robust, significant, meaningful engagement platform, time, talent, treasure, and ties, but with all three of those hopefully driving the treasure component, we're going to be in trouble. You are the solution. You are a significant solution to the revenue profile of the institution going forward. Each and every single gift drives what we do. And in fact, I will predict those of you who choose to give and hopefully do so in meaningful ways, it's our responsibility to thank you, steward you, tell you how your gift makes a difference. Some of you will be at a point where because you've been doing that for 15 or 20 or 30 years, you might be in a place to make a major gift, a principal gift. Think about a deferred gift to the institution. That's really important. It's really exciting because it's going to make a marginal difference in the places that are the margin of excellence. Going to be able to move the needle in really important ways and likely very specific in people's lives. So that our answer is right there. Now, people like me lose jobs because we don't raise more and more money. And I would argue people like me have done a poor job selling and selling institutions that we need to spend our time here. And in fact, it doesn't begin here. Where should it begin? When you're on campus. I can't, and we can't make you have a good experience. We can't make you have a great experience, but we can certainly unfold who we are and what we do and why it's important and increase the likelihood that you will consider making a gift back to the institution. Uh, analytics, we built predictive models. We pointed at alumni and friends who we think are most likely to give to various aspects on campus, whether it be a facility project, whether it be upgrading their gifts at a level higher than what they give at now, whether it be 
donors who have lapsed and have decided to make a gift again or are considering making a gift again. How do we use our data with 41,000 prospective individuals to ask and invite to uh, give and uh, affect the diversity of our revenue profile? How do we start that work? And we believe predictive modeling is part of the reason and, and, and ability that we can improve what we do. So for example, the annual fund elapsed reactivation likelihood, that's a mouthful, right? We have a model now, the data just came back in, where we have, we can point at the 764 alumni who we think have an 81% chance of giving again, and they haven't given in each of the last five years. We've modeled them because of their characteristics in the database, we've modeled them against 10,000 other donors who have the exact same characteristics and give. We can, in a predictive model, understand where it makes sense to place our resources. Being smart so that the expenses that are involved in our enterprise have a high return on investment. And the case for support, almost at the end here. Our case for support has been weak. Why give? It's a simple question. Many of you go into nonprofit work, even if you're not the fundraiser, I didn't grow up to be a fundraiser, that wasn't, you know, who, who, who graduates with a degree in fundraising? But, but you end up sometimes in roles where you get to, you get the opportunity to talk about an institution, to sell an institution, and then become very excited, excited about inviting others to invest in an institution. <coughs> and so you have to make a case for support. If you're in the for-profit sector and you're generating capital for uh, your, your organization, you're going to have to make a case for support. You're going to have to sell something. You're going to sell product. You're going to sell service. Ultimately, a case for support has similar characteristics. Distinctiveness and excellence. What's different about you? Why does it matter? I think Grinnellians, different than many of our peers nationally, when they give, they want to make a difference. And a gift to Grinnell is often a gift through Grinnell because of the work that many of you do and the work and the mission of Grinnell College. It's bigger than just the streets and the walls that encircle campus. A case has to be about the future. Where are we headed? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to achieve? And how will philanthropy impact that? How will Grinnell's future include the Grinnell that we all know Grinnell can be 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, only because of plan. You Hopefully you can apply this to some of your thinking about the careers you're going into and the ways that you're going to sell yourself and sell the organizations you would join. We have to address the endowment. $1.8 billion endowment, right? Why do you need my money? I would argue that an investment in Grinnell is investment in the margin of excellence that the endowment pays to keep the lights on, philanthropy doesn't. Many of you will be invited to give to worthwhile causes all over the world, and you should give. But not every one of those causes, like Grinnell, can say that your gift actually is creating space where there's a margin of excellence. It's okay to give and create, to keep the lights on, it's okay to give and do many of those basic needs of organizations, but at Grinnell it's different. We've positioned our case for support in many respects as a either or. Grinnellians want to give in a lot of ways. You should. Alumni should. We, we believe it's an and proposition. Give where your heart is, and we hope it includes you now. Donors are investment partners. And if we talk about the revenue profile and we talk about a return on investment, every donor who has given to support your education is investing in a 50-year, maybe 60-year return on that investment because of the course of your life, what you will go do. And arguably, we need to stay away from the concept of need. An institution like Grinnell, with a $1.8 billion endowment, positioning a case for support based on need invites the wrong questions. Why do you need my money? Right? So going forward, diversification within the three <coughs> components of the revenue profile is absolutely essential. Philanthropy, the endowment, and that's new revenue. That went backwards. 
We have to adjust that program. Well, I got a little funny on this one, didn't yeah. I'm, I'm still a little bit confused um, on the idea of net student revenue increasing. Is there going to be increase in enrollment and increase in the percentage of students paying full tuition or increase in overall tuition? All of those components are under evaluation. So for example, what if we increase the total student body by five? We're talking about the margins here. Yeah. Um, what if we recruited more students who could pay? Or what if the students who are in the pipeline now of 6,500 applications, what if more of those who could pay some of or all of, in fact, do choose to go to Grinnell College? Um, a proxy for brand strength in the marketplace can be the number of students and families who pay tuition. The willingness to pay the price tag. Now again, we're lucky at Grinnell College, we got all students receive scholarships here. Every single student has a scholarship here at Grinnell College. Uh, and for many who can't afford to pay, we provide the assistance to make sure and ensure that the Grinnell education happens because those students are perfect for Grinnell College. But yes. Slight growth in student body could happen at some point. Converting more families who could pay a little bit more could happen. We can't control all of that, though, the admissions decision. We know. So Joe Bagnoli would be someone to bring in our Vice President for Admissions and Enrollment to dive deeper into their strategies. To, that, has to, that all connects in that and super revenue space. But there's trade-offs in all of those decisions, right? Not every trade-off is a good one for Grinnell College. I would argue the better job we can in growing the endowment, and more significantly, the more philanthropy we can raise, we may not have to go down some of those other trade-off paths. It's interesting to think the revenue would drive something, right? Behind the scenes, kind of. Uh, yeah, this sort of question next to the other question, but uh, I mean, how? you see the college, or as the college been talking about with you and with the other administrators about you know, the unsustainable nature of increasing student prices and yeah. institutions. I mean, my niece, when she comes here, will be paying over $100,000 in yeah. student I have two daughters, actually. We will soon have a third here in September. Um, if you run the rate with inflation, uh, college pricing index inflation, we would be paying hundred grand per year for tuition for each of my girls. I'm not going to be able to afford that. Uh, no, very few people can. So, so it is on an unsustainable path. I predict in the next 20 years, we will probably see somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of the colleges nationwide close the It's pretty scary, isn't it? Some will merge. The merger and acquisition that, that takes place, but uh, based based on sticker price and the inability to just continue to ratchet that up, um, a place like Grinnell can actually do it because of the endowment that we have, which is largely unrestricted. It wasn't created by donors, so we have a lot of flexibility in how we use that money, and largely can pour it into student financial aid. And a significant opportunity to grow philanthropy because we've not performed well in that space. I think it gives us one of the highest likelihood nationally to keep tuition increases as flat as possible. If, if anyone can do it. And that's something you should be proud of. I, I hope you are, but now or at some point. Not that the price tag now is something that you get all that excited about, but the fact that we have a, a, a fighting chance to do so. Uh, I, I'm pretty proud of work here. So, I don't know what we have for time. Are we have time? We're okay? Yes, we're, we're just fine. Okay. So, <coughs> make a gift of $100 to your now college. What do you support and why? Yeah, go for it. Um, 
I was discussing this with some friends at the end of my um, seminar, and we're like, okay, well, we're, we're French majors, and not being in the STEM field, we'd be like, we should have more support. Um, and so if we were donating, we would want to give to the French department, or yep. the French house, or just in areas that we like want something to happen, and we didn't have the funding for that. So an academic program where you had an experience and to give them the resources yes. to invest in other students like you. Okay? We have a $100 gift in the French department. Is that a good decision? What do you guys think? You're not students. Uh, this is my first lecture. In Nine months. I've heard things I, I, get more interesting. One, one, one of the big differences I, I see between a lot of uh, the science majors and the uh, humanities majors as far as resources available is that, you know, uh, there's tons of lounges of noise that are dedicated to economics, math, biology, you know, I think chemistry people even have their own, like, personal, like, computer, like, desk space. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know, like, I think it's the, the math comments they got, like, Giant bag of coffee, coffee maker, fridge, microwave. There's there's no Spanish lounge, there's no French lounge or anything like that. A hundred dollars would go a long way just for like study breaks, or you know maybe having some kind of like some 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 resource for the humanities majors that are I need a break, and maybe that's just like there's like a whole like handy like I I, I don't know. you can't do a lot with a hundred dollars, but um, I, I think it would be meaningful because there is like a certain there's, there's a difference, you know, and the resources available to students. You know. So we've got an investment in the French department, we've got an investment in a bowl of candy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a nice bowl of candy. <laughs> nice. So it's more of the student experience. For there's The student experience. So it's it's maybe not in the classroom, but it is <coughs> around what supports the classroom experience. Okay. Actually, would it be ridiculous to buy a, like a, a washing machine and dry it for the French house? Like, we actually just talked about that because it's really just to like walk from the French house, which is across the, the traffic light, to Yonkou, which is where we're supposed to go. I don't know. Is it ridiculous to buy a washer and dryer? Like, would that be something that the college would like, yes, we will take your gift for that? What do you think? Is that a good idea? I suppose if you've been in the French house, you'd know the answer to that question, right? Change the rules. You're going to invest in a change the rules one? No, no, because, I mean, no. <laughs> but I mean, like, Grinnell House has a washer and dryer there yeah. that they could easily use um, a, a house away. So mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to bring up. Mm -hmm. Sounds like washer and dryer. <laughs> We're at washer and dryer and bowl can. Okay? What else? Anything different? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess that, like I've, uh, s some of the donations that um, that that people were giving um, in Phonathon, like when I worked mm -hmm. with Phonathon, was like specifically to like scholarships or like I feel like that would be like really beneficial mm -hmm. to whatever like first generation students coming in or like mm -hmm. specific like you know like multicultural groups on campus and stuff. And I feel like that would go a long way. I feel like for me, like um, my personal interest would go sort of like to that, but then maybe. <coughs> the theater and dance department who, you know what I mean, whatever yeah. special interests like people were saying. Um, so yeah. directed at a, a certain type of student, either yeah. on the financial aid side or somewhere else More on campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta call him the Green Bay Packers hat. Because I'm a Chicago Bears fan. I know, so. I know, yeah. <laughs> cool. What do you think? Where would you go, where would you send your $100? <laughs> um, Which the Bears are going to be the Packers? Hmm? Bears are going to be the Packers. No, not a chance. You just like the head? No? Not a chance. No? That's probably true, unfortunately. I guess towards a design model. Better food. Better food. Okay. Anybody else buying better food with $100? If I don't rate, like, how would I know where my money goes? I, because I'm 
So donors at this institution, regardless of the, the, the amount they give, can point very specifically at what they'd like to support. And so long, yep, so long as a fund exists, they can give to it. So we are in the process of creating funds all over campus. Now, we don't have a washer and dryer fund for the French house. Um, but the beauty is we're creating a structure that if you say you want to do that, we can call and make sure that, in fact, they can put in a washer and dryer there. And that if it, so long as it costs $100 and no more, great, Blanche, we just made that happen. So uh, the point here is, if there's something you want to support, ask. Share, inform, tell. Our goal would be to work with you to determine what it is that we could align that. Um, is there a reason why Grinnell wouldn't accept the donation? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't had this experience at Grinnell, but you can apply to Grinnell. I'll give you the experience. Um, I, uh, I worked at Iowa State University, and my first day on the job, I had, uh, and this was in the first two hours, I had somebody call and ask if they could donate full semen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that was that was a, a nice gesture. Actually, that carries a very high dollar value. <laughs> it really does. It, it really does. Um, we didn't need bull semen. <laughs> so we department. didn't have a. We asked. No one had a use for it, so we politely declined. Um, <laughs> do, donors who want to give to something that the institution can't or won't do, we have to say we have to say no. So, for example, if there was a policy on campus that said no can. We got a call that said, here's $100 for a whole candy. We unfortunately have to say. Do you guys then direct them towards a way that they can give their full semen or whatever else <laughs> to some other organizations? Well, best practice would say, what else can we try to do with uh, another way you can support the institution? Okay. Certainly, if we can provide advice, we can do so. so. Let's take this question. You've got another zero involved. Now you have $1,000. A lot of candy in a bowl. What would you do with a thousand dollars if, at some point in your life, you could write that check or pledge it out over maybe a couple of years? What would you, what would you do with a thousand dollars at the institution? Yeah. Can you give it to the endowment so they can reinvest it? Ooh, there's an interesting one. Give it to the endowment. Why would you give it to the endowment? I want to make a thousand dollars so far, like every year, if you're reinvesting in that money. So, like, if you guys have 27 percent return, like, that would be that would go a long way. You continue to have that percentage of return. Not that you guys will have 27 percent. So, you would give to something that would exist in perpetuity, yeah. forever grow and give back to the institution. So, you would support what within the endowment? Just the endowment itself and anything that it spins off to support, or is there something that you would hope that endowment would do? Well, what do you guys invest in? That's what we do. Um, many of you receive scholarships that are endowed. Where a donor says, I want this scholarship awarded, but I want, I want it awarded every year from now to the end of Grinnell College. Now, I will say $1,000 is not enough to create an yeah. scholarship, but nonetheless, that's the, the structure. Interesting. Permanent cash flow to the institution. Fruit trees. That's Fruit like trees. trees. Around campus. That's our Does that make a difference? A hundred versus a thousand? Yeah. Absolutely. Does that change your, your thinking a bit? Mm -hmm. Some of you are going to be in this very seat someday. I hope I'm on the phone talking to you. To live long enough, but I hope I'm on the phone talking to you. Okay. Let's really up the game here. What are you going to do with a million dollar gift to the institution? I would donate to like something to do with like facilities management or okay. 
the whole, or the arrangement of the space. Okay. Uh, or when they want to build a new building. So new building. Or add in to other buildings and stuff, such as the ARH mm -hmm. addition, just kind of so that they have extra money to make it nicer. Okay. And, so, so that, and then that would keep living on too in building form. The physical infrastructure of campus helps us recruit students, much better experience and better space for yeah. students, for faculty, teaching. Make a biodome maybe. Make a biodome. Trap the heat in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably want to establish a yearly scholarship that's need line for international students, like perhaps a percentage of college. So a, a scholarship for international students. And a million dollar endowment at Grinnell College would pay out forty thousand dollars a year toward the scholarship each and every year. To perpetuity, assuming the market to perform reasonably well. It's almost a full tuition scholarship. Yep. That's pretty impressive. Like, that student would study in the bio <laughs> <laughs> and eat some candy <laughs> next to somebody else who chooses to eat fruit from the tree. I thought the dorm life is pretty shitty, especially for first years. They get put in some of the worst rooms on campus. Mm -hmm. They have to sleep in the same room as another person, so I'd like to improve dorm life. The dorm life. Yeah. So something in the. Uh, change the dorm somehow. Student affairs. I don't know if they need people supporting them, I think they just need better rooms. So you also on the construction site create physical space. To uh, kind of going along those lines, uh, some maybe like first year event. Uh, so pre-orientation, so you can like, uh, I know other colleges have this, but you kind of go on like maybe a camping trip or a river rafting trip with another group of freshmen, uh, and just kind of use that way to support free trips like that. So I think that go a long way in, uh, I don't know, promoting friendship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of build rapport, early rapport, yeah. collegiality, community amongst incoming first year. Well, I hope each and every one of you are in a position to do those at some point in time in your life. My guess is you're going to start post-graduation somewhere in this space. I, hope, I, I personally want to invite you to join in with us. Uh, consider even making a nominal gift while you're a student. I know that's part of what we're doing. Uh, it's really impressive when I sit across from an alum. I do this it's a distinct honor, honor to do this regularly. Sit across the table from an alum and ask them to think about giving 100,000 or a million. Just had a recent conversation about a 10 million dollars <coughs> to the institution. Okay? And to be able to say, you know what, we're asking you to do it, and our students do it too. Our faculty do it too. Our trustees, our alumni, our staff do it too. Um, so please accept this personal invitation to think about even at whatever level makes sense, give back. If you start now at Optum, you can come ahead and go forward. I'm happy to take any other questions, Doug. Uh, are there uh, particular points in, in the life cycle that uh, you would emphasize? Uh, for instance, 50th reunion, is there a push at that point to uh, get the class again? Yeah. Yeah, you will experience reunion every <coughs> year ending in five and zero. Uh, and each one of those have a, have a, a call out to, to support either a class fundraising goal or a personal goal that you may have. And any one of the ideas that you brought up, the heaviest encouragement though is at the 50th reunion, and that's often, you think about phases of life, right? There's a time to, time to learn, a time to earn, and a time to give away. You know, often when you get to the, the 50th year, you're in a bit of a distribution phase of, of your life. So that's when we see greater giving efforts. Can we talk about uh, the survey of um, younger alums? Sure. And uh, let's see. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, you see anybody walking around with squirrels on there? So, we generated. I don't know if I have a new update or not. We had when I walked in here, we had generated nearly 400 gifts today, totaling almost fifty thousand uh, dollars. And this is the first time that uh, the college has done that. We actually have donors, alumni, one of whom is a trustee, Patricia Finkelman. They've initiated a match, a challenge match today, where um, this afternoon and into the evening, every gift that's given, they'll match with a $250 gift. So you give a dollar, and it creates a $251 gift to the institution. And here's a little secret. About an hour, they're going to double their challenge, and it's going to be $500. So a gift of a dollar to the institution. At about 5 o'clock today, will be worth $501. And we've got a... Uh, a station someplace up here on campus. Yeah, we've had stations up all over campus. They're going to be around, I think, till about 5 o'clock. Uh, we accept gifts online. And also, there's uh, voting for the, uh, the best event or the most important event. Yeah, we've got marbles in Bach, a couple of different places where you can vote for your favorite Greenhouse you know, traditional event. And I think that that's very interesting because it, it begins to emphasize the heritage of the, of the college and put that in a positive context. Okay, well, um, this is the uh, set of questions that are were generated by NAR for the uh, Young Alumni Survey. So I'll uh, and we'll be talking about this more on Thursday. But um, let's take a look at these questions. And uh, Shane, you might have some comments on uh, um, how this information can be helped. Yeah, so, so this intelligence uh, is going to help inform literally our case for support. And as we uh, author a new case for support that will manifest itself online, in print, and in the way that we talk about giving to our alumni, your answers are going to help inform the development of that case for support, literally, word for word. Uh, so we're going to be paying very close attention to the notes that you take, and we will influence that case for support. Downstream, starting next year in the Phonathon program, as we call young alumni, we think about the intel that you've provided to us, it will help inform the scripting of phone calls for young alumni when we call and engage them in a conversation about giving back uh, to, uh, to the college. So the important thing is, is that this is research that can be used and will be used in order to inform the, the way that DAR goes about some of its business. And that makes it very important for you to do a, a good job of uh, talking to the alumni. Contextually, our office for a very long time, and Doug, you jump in here if I'm off base too much, but our office had been viewed by our alumni as a, as a less than professional, less than significant part of their lives. Um, I'm not necessarily offended by that, it's just the intelligence that was, has been there for a period of time. Um, so you're likely going to hear negative points of feedback. Uh, I think that's good because we have to be open to what you're hearing determine ways to overcome those those challenges. But I'll, I'll suggest, is, is anyone here thinking about going into fundraising? Again, it wasn't on the front of my mind when I graduated college, but today says here things I want to go ask for money for. How about, okay, nonprofits again, anyone in the nonprofit space? Okay, so anybody in for-profit, capital raising, finance? How many are, have no bloody clue? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I will. If if some of you end up in nonprofit work and are soliciting gifts, this script that you're using, <coughs> in many respects, follows the exact conversation that we have with alumni in person when we're cultivating gifts <coughs> of five and six and seven and eight figures. Understanding who someone is, what motivates behavior, what challenges behavior. These are some of the conversation points that we have with our alumni. So 
if nothing else, consider it a good opportunity to practice because you may in fact need to go back to the script at some point later. So this will be an important information to be gathered. Yes. And this is, and this is one way in which you yeah. will be able to help shape the behavior of the institution. After, let's see, how many are seniors now? Yeah, we've got a good batch of them. And, and probably most of you who are seniors will graduate. <laughs> to that institution 
And as the president of the college used to have told all of the perspectives, you have now begun and matriculated at, at Carleton College. You are forever part of Carleton, and Car Carleton is forever part of you. The same could be said of Renelians. Um, One of the things that I think <coughs> that we will probably find in our, our um, interviews with the Grinnellians, they have, by and large, a very, very positive feeling about the, about the college. They may have negative feelings about some of the experiences of the college, but overall, it's a, it's a bright and shining part of their, um, their past and their present as well. So this is, this is one thing that uh, when I think about sustainability of colleges, and I think you rightly predicted that we would lose a lot of, of uh, institutions of higher education in the next few years. I mean, you know, we've already had Antioch a couple of years ago and had to reorganize entirely. And that was a very proud institution. We all have already had Sweetbriar uh, just in just the past, past, past month. Decided they're closing their doors. And it will happen all over. Don't let it happen to Grinnell. And that really is your responsibility and the responsibility of others who graduate from this institution. No one cares about the institution more than the alums. The idea is, we're talking about sustainability here, and this is a key kind of institution to think about. And uh, we will begin thinking about how we talk to uh, the uh, young alumni. And I, I'm glad that you showed the slides that show that this is an extremely critical part of our alumni population. We need to know what, what their values are. Need to know what interests, what drives them, what their passions are, and so on. So I think that we're going to have some exceptionally interesting and important work to do for the second half of the semester. So with all of that, why don't we um, see if there are any further questions? That okay. If anyone oh. ever wants to connect. One on one or in groups. Uh, it does certainly has my contact information, but it's, but it's online. Uh, if you want to go into uh, this career field, if you want to discuss nonprofit work and, and dive deeper into any of these concepts, if you want to be a fundraiser, if you want to talk about what that means and what career options and career fields exist for you. Um, if you just want to sit down and say, I have no, I have no clue what I want to do, but Tell me, what are some of our alumni doing and how can I connect some of those dots? Uh, just a phone call or an email away if you have to spend some time uh, with you at any point. Okay.